hemostasis yesterday. So I want to look at that and then we may, we'll have time to get started on immune system organs, but we certainly won't finish it. Because I don't have three hours of lab to keep talking to you too on Fridays. Um, so blood typing. What is another word, if you're looking at your lecture notes and the tables on the um, online PowerPoints, anybody know what another word for an antibody is? It rhymes with antigen. Well, the last part of it is antigen. Yeah, you're close. Agglutinogen. Say it again. Agglutinogen. Right. So that is... Another name for an antibody. Anybody know where antibodies come from? Since we will talk about it on Thursday next week. Plasma cells. Plasma cells. All right. So B lymphocytes, and we'll talk about this process next week. Remember, have like T lymphocytes, the nucleus takes up almost the entire <coughs> intracellular volume. And then when they are activated by the antigen through a process involving uh, T helper cells and often macrophages, they undergo intracellular changes, including the addition of ribosomal ER and Golgi apparatus because antibodies are proteins, and they convert to plasma cells. So plasma cells are B lymphocytes that are making antibodies. Okay. So for our A and our B antibodies, this happens very early in life because babies are born with these A and B antibodies. Um, and then the D antigen, remember, you have to be exposed to. That is the antigen activation and the source of the D antibodies if you are negative, you have negative blood. So we were looking at some blood typing, and I had time to review this, go over this with the afternoon class, but I didn't with you. We talked about erythroblastosis metallic, remember? Mm -hmm. And I wrote the word on the board. So if the mother is Rh positive, and the dad is Rh negative, there be a problem? So here's the mother. She is Rh positive. If she is heterozygous, of course the daddy is homozygous, then it's possible that the baby can be Rh negative. So if the baby's blood cells, once the baby is born and the placenta separates, if the baby's blood cells move into the mother then at that time, is there going to be a problem? Yes. Yes. If it moves into the mother, yes. She hasn't been, she's not, I don't know. Negative means there is an absence of the D antigen. So there is nothing to trigger in the response. The mother has the D antigen, so the fact that the baby cells do not isn't going to be a problem. Okay? So if the mother is Rh positive, there is never going to be a erythroblastosis fatalis problem. If she has the D antigen. She's never going to make antibodies against herself. And her blood cells are too large. They're not going to cross the placenta. So they're not going to get into the baby. The baby's not going to make antibodies. Um, and even if they did, they would just be a few of the mother's cells. So that wouldn't be a problem. Okay? So never a problem. Doesn't matter what the father's blood type is. If the mother is Rh positive, this is never a problem. If the mother is Rh negative. And the father is Rh positive. He could be um, homozygous or heterozygous. So let's say he's heterozygous. And the baby is Rh negative. So the baby 
is got that gene, got that gene, and is Rh negative. Not a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, because baby's blood cells are the same as the mom's blood cells. The only time there would be a problem is if the baby is Rh positive. The baby is born, and its blood cells, some of its blood cells get into the mom. The baby's out here. Now the mom's bloodstream, lymphocytes, will respond to this D antigen and will become plasma cells and make antibodies and destroy, agglutinate, and um, then some of those cells will remain behind as memory cells and just a few minutes to hours can be activated to release antibodies again. It takes about three days for this first process to occur for priming, if you will, the creation of the first cells that are synthesizing antibodies against the D antigen. All right, so those remain behind, capable of releasing more antibodies. And now she has another pregnancy. If it's Rh negative again, still no problem. If it's Rh positive, then these antibodies can cross the placenta and bind to the fetus's positive, excuse me, positive blood cells. Okay? And that's the erythroblastosis fatalis. So let's say the baby is born and the mother didn't uh, have any early shots. The baby is born with erythroblastosis fatalis. It needs a transfusion. So the mother, let's say, is A negative and the baby is A positive, what would be the best blood to transfuse that baby with? A negative or A positive blood? So the baby is A positive and needs a transfusion. Would it be best to give it A positive blood or A negative blood? Now normally you would be getting the blood that you, remember we said a positive can get both negative or positive. Mm -hmm. The reason that negative would be chosen as the best blood type to be given is there's going to be residual antibodies from the mother in the baby. Mm -hmm. So just to avoid additional, it would be diluted out by the transfusion, but just to avoid, we already know they're there because of the baby has a race for blastosis vitalis. So just to avoid giving more blood cells that have the D antigen on it, it's best to go ahead and give the negative blood type. Wouldn't you have to make take extra special care to make sure that any negative blood doesn't have their antigen? Yeah. You would do that in the testing and cross and the cross matching. Alright? Now um, if there's anything else I covered with that, maybe it is. Okay. Any other questions on yes? So the D, is the D antibody present if you're negative? Uh -huh. Remember on the, t on the board yesterday I wrote only if exposed. Uh, so, so the mother originally did not have the D antibody okay. until her first Rh positive baby, whether it was a miscarriage or a pregnancy that uh, died and dissolved into her body or one that she actually carried to term. The first Rh positive or even a transfusion um, that exposes would create plasma cells that are capable of making the antibody against the D antigen. And some of these would remain behind as memory cells, so on the next exposure, they are ready to go in hours. So, it's flooded with antibodies. So the mother can become exposed to the D antibody if the antigen, if the fetus blood passes away in the blood. Right. Okay. So then when she is pregnant again, then. So that leads us back to the Rogam shot. So remember when I talked about proteins that are in plasma globulins were one of the type of proteins? And a gamma globulin is our amino gamma, gamma globulin here. And so in the mother, let's say, let's go back to this original situation where we had the first baby that was Rh positive and at birth. 
some of the baby cells end up in the mother. Remember I said it takes about three days, 72 hours for her B lymphocytes to become plasma cells making antibodies. So when the Rogam shot was first developed, they would test the baby. If it was Rh positive um, at birth, they would test the baby. And if it was Rh positive, they would give her ro the Rogam shot, which the Rogam shot is antibodies against the D antigen. And they agglutinate, they would disperse throughout the mother's blood and agglutinate any fetal blood cells that they came in contact with, with the D antigen. The purpose of that being to destroy those cells before the mother's B lymphocytes went through the process of becoming activated and making their own antibodies. So the next time she had an Rh positive baby, it would be as if it was her first. Does that make sense? So removing the stimulus. Can you just repeat what Rogan does? Okay, so here's the baby's blood cells in the mother's blood. And they have the D antigen. That's a foreign antigen for the mother. So normally her plasma cells would come in, her B lymphocytes would come in contact with that and be primed to start making the antibody. The Rogam is a shot of D antibodies. They would do this, they would agglutinate the fetus's red blood cells, not the mother's because she doesn't have a D antigen on her cells. They would agglutinate the fetus's blood cells like this and cause them to go a process of rupture and they would be processed in the liver and so on before the mother's B lymphocytes became activated. Next week we'll talk about this is an example of passive immunity. So once those antibodies are aged and broken down, the mother no longer has antibodies in her blood against the D antigen. She would have to be given another Rogam shot. Okay? And again, that's the same thing that happens if you get a snake bite. You don't have three days to, sometimes it takes a couple of weeks to mount a full-blown response. Because even if you get them, they don't rise quite as high as the secondary response. You could be very sick or dead from the snake venom if you waited for your own system to develop antibodies. So an anti-venom injection has antibodies already in it against the snake <coughs> toxin and clusters around them and coats them and prevents them from being toxic to your body because you don't have time to make them, all right? So that's what's happening here. So this would, have, this would occur each time the mother had a baby, they would test to see if the baby was positive, and if it was, she would get the Rogam shot. Now, they don't even wait for that to happen. They will give the mother this shot. It used to be once during the pregnancy, and I think, you know, you said it was twice now. Um, whether or not the baby, doesn't even matter, just as a, uh, um, being prepared, prophylactic, is what I was looking for. Okay. So, just in case, um, it prevents the mother from, now if she had already gotten pregnant and didn't know it and the baby died, then she would already have those antibodies, all right, but this would also help to decrease the number of them if she was pregnant and already had those antibodies. All right? Any other questions on the regular blood typing? So, so practice. Uh, do some, you know, sample questions and stuff once you have the mechanism down. Um, we didn't do, we looked at blood typing, but what we didn't, one more thing, what we didn't look at was some practice on what type of transfusion you give somebody, okay? So if someone has a blood type, um, O positive, and they need a transfusion. So let's go through, let's, let's slow down a little bit here and go through the steps. So remember, we need to look at what antibodies are in their blood, and then we cannot give them a blood type that has those antigens. So what antibodies would be present in O positive blood? A, B. A. So A 
add B. So we couldn't give them any blood that had A or B antigens. That leaves us with, oh, yeah, all right. What about the positives here? Did they get positive or negative? Does it matter? It doesn't matter. matter. Because they have positive, so we can give them either or. Okay? So they can receive O positive or O negative. But I want you to go through those steps. Okay? So that you can, you, you've got the confidence um, behind you. All right, let's say that they have B negative blood. What would their antigen, antibody be in the blood? A. So they can receive any blood type that doesn't have the A antigen. So, not antibody, antigen. So they can receive B, but there's no A antigen on that. And they can receive O. Now, their blood type is negative. So we only want to give them negative because we don't know if they have antibodies against, or they don't have antigen. We don't want them to develop antibodies against the Okay, so the minute you were to give them something with positive, their body would already start making the antibodies. So. Yeah. Or they may already have antibodies. We don't know that. Oh, okay. So they get attacked. Yeah. All right. Um, let's do who they could donate to. So now, they can donate to somebody that doesn't have antibodies against their antigen. So blood type A, B, positive. So now we're looking at the antigen. So they have A antigen, B antigen, and D antigen. So we don't want to give anything that would have antibodies against A or B or D. So we can't give to O because O would have antibodies against A and B. Okay. So can we give to A? Nope, because A would have antibodies against B. We can't give to B because B would have antibodies against a, and we can't give to negative because negative might have antibodies against D, and if they didn't, we would cause them to be developed. So, what's left? A, B positive. A, B positive. Okay. But I wanted to go through the steps. That's more that I, I'm more con, you know, concerned that you understand the steps because you're going to use the same steps no matter what the choice. All right, so let's do, put me with this one, A negative. So what antigens are present? A only. Okay. So we can't give to B. Because they have antibodies. Because B would have antibodies against A. We can't, well, we definitely can give to A. Can we give to O? No. No, because O would have antibodies against A. Can we give to AB? Yes. It has antibodies. It has AB. It has antibodies. AB? No. It has no antibodies. Oh. Right? Because it has the antigens A and it has the antigens B. So AB would have no antibodies. Right? Oh, yeah, it has none. So. It's negative, so we can give to A positive or A negative. So we understand why we can't give, can we give to um, A, B? Because it has an Remember, our universal recipient, our really selfish person, is the baby positive. Yeah. They could get everything. Okay? All right, well, I said that was the last one. Okay. It's antigen. What antigens does the O positive have? D. So can we 
give O to A? Yes. Because there's no antigens to have antibodies against. Well, A doesn't have, so remember O is our universal donor. So it can get to everything. Positive or negative? Positive. Positive only. Okay. So on your exam for the blood typing, for the lecture exam, what I will do is um, give you a table with a couple of blood types and ask you to tell me who they can donate to or receive from. And I have them already written out and then you just circle whether or cross out whichever ones that they can use. Okay. All right, let's move on to hemostasis. And again, the practice here is, again, you're not memorizing. You're not memorizing a bunch of stuff. It's those basic rules about recognizing what blood type has what antibodies. And you just want to avoid the antigen going into the antibodies that would match it. I put up the word agglutinogen is to remind you that this process of antibody antigen interaction is has a specific name of agglutination. It is not the same as coagulation. When a clot is formed, I don't know if I can make this in the dark or not. When a clot is formed, that is coagulation. It's a completely separate event from agglutination. The whole process of stopping or decreasing blood flow is known as hemostasis. All right, this comes from, have you ever heard of a certain group of drugs known as styptics? The, I told you about the circumcisions on the infants just after they were born, before they went home from the hospital. And we would wrap a gauze around the circumcision uh, site that had this powder chemical on it to stop the bleeding that was known as a styptic. And that means to um, stop, obviously. It actually means drug in Greek, but it's the drugs that would stop blood flow. And so when we look at hemostasis, most people think of platelets and coagulation clots is the same thing. They're not. They're intricately related, but they're not exactly the same thing. So we have a series of events that occur. Um, actually, there are three steps that are involved. And back to our first term, hemostasis, so stoppage of blood flow. And the very first event to occur is vasoconstriction or vascular spasm. We'll come back and look at these um, again. Then, that's immediate, right? That's not going to occur at capillaries though. So if you have torn capillaries, there's no smooth muscle to contract. Um, but in our larger vessels, there are. Then we have platelet plug formation. And again, this is not a clot. It is a platelet plug. It may have a clot within it, all right? It might have, or around it, it might be within the clot itself, but 
we can spin down, we can put blood in a, hematic, in a hematocrit tube, spin it down, take the plasma off of the top. Will the plasma clot? Do you remember what the definition of serum was? Blood minus plasma minus the clotting protein. So plasma will thicken and gel up without red blood cells, without platelets, without <coughs> white blood cells. All right, so just like a clear gelatin, you can have a clot. It helps to strengthen the platelet plug by forming these threads around the platelets, but you can have a coagulation occur without the platelet plug itself. All right. And then we polymerize fibrin proteins into long fibrin threads, and that is coagulation. So this is the polymerization of fibrinogen, which are globular proteins, to fibrin, which is a form of long proteins, and then water gets trapped in that. And when water doesn't flow, the water being the fluid of the plasma, we have a clot. So in the blood, obviously, we're going to have platelets and red blood cells trapped within these fibrin threads, but they don't have to be there for the clot to occur. So looking at the vascular phase, that's the first thing. So we have a cut, all right? Um, and this vascular phase and platelet plugs are often all the body needs for small tears. So you bump into a table, all right? You might get a bruise um, if you bump really hard. But much of the blood vessels there have stopped because of the vascular constriction and platelets that are sticking. You don't need the actual fibrin threads. So there's three things here that can initiate or trigger the vascular phase, and often all of them are involved at the same time. So direct injury to the smooth muscle, right? Cut yourself shaving or whatever. And uh, then endothelial cells, the simple squamous cells that line the blood vessels will release chemicals, and platelets will release chemicals. They actually release three prominent ones, but these are the two that are involved in vasoconstriction. Remember seeing thromboxane before? Yeah. It was one of the icosanoids listed when we first started talking about the endocrine system. And then neuroreflexes, pain, and the uh, sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine, and that causes constriction of the blood vessels as well. Then we have the platelet plug formation. And we talked about platelets yesterday. Some of you may have noticed them when you were looking in the microscope and you saw the little purple dots scattered among the red blood cells. So if our red blood cell was this size, platelets are going to be approximately that size. Okay. Um, they are typically small little sacs, round, that are floating in the blood and the spits in the blood, and they have their origin from a very large cell. Our monocytes were about 18 to 20 microns in diameter. A lot of ours were collapsed yesterday. The megakaryocyte, its name means large cell, um, is about three times the size of a monocyte. Right? So they're way too large to leave the bone marrow even through the sinusoids. So this cell right here is the megakaryocyte. And these are platelets that are pinching off. And so platelets are really just plasma membrane sacs of chemicals. The three major chemicals are uh, serotonin, uh, thromboxane, A2, and, ATB, and ADP. So the megakaryocytes are found in the blood, and then, I mean in the bone marrow, and then the platelets are found in the blood. So these would be the platelets over here right here and here. You can see them kind of clustered up here. The plasma membrane is folded multiple times and that makes it easier for the pinching off to occur. So we have a cut, as you can see, in the blood vessel. And a couple of things occur. Collagen fibers are exposed from the tunica intima. And the endothelial cells 
uh, release a chemical that's normally floating around in the blood all the time, um, but more of it is released when the cells are damaged, and it's called this von Willebrand factor. So here's another uh, image of it. So here's our damaged blood vessels, the collagen fibers. The collagen fibers are